Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Explorer Series talk this evening. Um, I hope you're doing well from wherever you're joining in from. My name is Lorena Medina Luna, and I am an Education and Outreach Specialist at NCAR, or the National Center for Atmospheric Research. If you're not familiar with NCAR, it's located in Boulder, Colorado, but today we're coming to you live from our own homes. And thank you for welcoming in us into your own spaces as well. NCAR is a world leading organization dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the earth system and the sun. And I'm very excited that you have decided to take some time to join us today. We have a very um, interesting lecture about the upper atmosphere and the ionosphere. Um, titled Space Storms in the Upper Atmosphere and the Atmosphere with Dr. Stan Solomon. Throughout this event, you'll be able to ask questions and engage with us through interactive polls using the Slido interface. So if you go down the, um, the page, if you haven't already done so, you can go into Slido by clicking on the link and you'll see that we have some active polls and a word cloud that you can participate in. The event will be archived in our NCAR Explorer series website. So definitely um, check it out, uh, check out other lectures that we've hosted and different conversations and events and let your friends um, know about this lecture. Um, it should be posted up in a couple of weeks. Um, and thank you uh, for our multimedia services, Dan and Aaliyah, uh, Brett and Paul who are helping us with this program tonight. Dan, would you be able to share with us what is the word cloud looking like for people who are um, participating in what is something you think of when you hear the word Aurora Borealis? Have the Northern Lights, beautiful nature's wonder, fantastic, only North, or also South Poles. That's a good question. You have the different lights that show up it's a light show, looks like curtains. Definitely welcome to continue entering your, um, your words on our word cloud. Thank you, Dan. And today I'd like to introduce you to our NCAR scientist, Dr. Stan Solomon. He is a scientist in the High Altitude Observatory Laboratory, and his research specializes on the physics and chemistry of the upper atmosphere and ionosphere. He received his AB from Harvard College and his master's and PhD from the University of Michigan. Go blue. Um, and throughout his career, Stan has researched the ways to analyze satellite measurements of aurora modeling of aurora physics and the upper atmosphere. As a scientist at NCAR, he was the deputy director of the High Altitude Observatory from 2005 to 2009, served as the acting director from October 2009 through June 2010, and he now leads the Geospace Frontiers section. He is currently on the Upper Atmosphere Model Development, um, working on Upper Atmosphere Model Development, excuse me, and the effects of solar geomagnetic variability and air glow simulations for the global scale observations of the LIM and DISC, or GOLD as it's known, mission. With that, I'll um, hand it over to you, Stan, to uh, show us a little bit about the research that you do, and um, we'll come back and answer questions at the end of the event. So throughout the event, welcome to ask us questions, but we'll hold off on answering those questions until the end Q&A session. Dan, uh, we'll uh, hand it over to Stan now. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, start here by sharing my screen so you can see my slides. And hopefully you still see me. Yes, we can still see you and the slides show up well. Good. So I'm going to discuss uh, space weather, uh, meaning storms and, and also quiet periods that occur in the upper atmosphere and ionosphere of the Earth. And when we uh, use this term space weather, it, it's really an analogy. Uh, the storms in this very uh, extended region of the Earth's atmosphere are very different. Um, they're not exactly the same thing 
as tropospheric storms, um, but it uh, their variability, sometimes dynamical variability, sometimes dramatic variability, that occurs in the in the system, and so so we uh, have given the, given uh, this the field that name in order to make it a little more accessible, uh, and and uh, but but it is in a way a branch of meteorology. It's just very, very different because because you have uh, electromagnetism involved, and and uh, and at the same time you don't have some of the complicating factors of the lower atmosphere like water, for instance. So I'm going to talk about the, the main source, not the only source, but the main source of space weather, which is variability in the sun and the, and the solar wind. Uh, say a few words about the magnetosphere, ionosphere interactions. I hope I don't have to introduce some of these terms. Magnetosphere is the extended uh, region around uh, near Earth space. It's controlled by the Earth's magnetic field. Um, say a few words about, about the impacts of, of uh, so, some of these variability, uh, and why, we, why we might care about uh, th things that, that occur in space weather, give an overview of the thermosphere and ionosphere system, really the atmosphere ionosphere system, because the thermosphere is part of the atmosphere. It's the, it's the very upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. And then talk about aurora, auroral forms, the, uh, the, the global electric circuit, how that leads to these, these uh, geospace storms that occur uh, in the magnetosphere ionosphere system, but, but large, to a great extent large, manifest themselves in the ionosphere. So I'm gonna start by showing this, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, photograph or, or set of uh, superposed photographs just because I like it so much. It's fairly recent. This is um, uh, a uh, image by uh, Miloslav Gutmuller uh, from the uh, taken during the uh, Great American Eclipse of 2017, and by use of um, uh, of, of uh, multiple images and image enhancement and some very some very sophisticated techniques, he has managed to really bring out the features in the, the in the solar corona that that tell you the great extent of which the corona is controlled by solar magnetism um, magnetism is going to be a constant theme of this talk uh, you can visualize through the illumination of these field lines the uh, the uh, morphology of the solar magnetic field uh, as if there were a bar magnet inside of it. And, and then you can see all this structure um, uh, due to uh, departures of that magnetic field from just a plain magnetic field to one that's controlled by active regions uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the sun. Um, the corona uh, and the magnetic field that's embedded within it stretches far out into space. In fact, you could consider the uh, corona of the sun as, as uh, you can consider the earth as being inside the corona of the sun even, um, because the solar wind constantly outflowing carries electrons from the sun, all electrons and protons. Um, uh, and, and in fact, other ions all the way to earth and the variability in all of those particles and fields are ultimately what's driving most of, of, uh, of, of uh, variability in the thermosphere ionosphere system. Not all of it, some of it is coming actually from the atmosphere below, from, from, uh, from the, uh, uh, the uh, troposphere and, and, and ground atmosphere interactions. Um, uh, but th those changes are somewhat less dramatic and we don't, we won't, uh, be able to get to that aspect of space weather today. So when we uh, think of solar magnetism, we uh, speak of active regions, which are places where the magnetic field is distorted and concentrated into, uh, into local, you might even call them hotspots. Um, and, uh, and these are associated with sunspots. 
they're they're not quite the same thing as sunspots, but they're different manifestations of the same process, which is variability in the solar magnetic field. So in, uh, uh, in order to understand how variable that is, we can look at, at, a, at a longer term record of solar magnetism that's manifested in this case by the sunspots before we had uh, uh, ultraviolet imagery. This is, a, this is an image in the ultraviolet. Uh, you can't, couldn't see this in the, in the plain visible light of the sun, but uh, by, um, by normal visible wavelength techniques, you can track sunspots and, and track for, for centuries really and give us a, a record of how variable the sun is. There's a pr approximately 11 year periodicity to that variability. That's uh, still not uh, uh, fully understood why that, that should the, uh, that the uh, solar activity should be so regular in, its, in the timing of its variability and yet so different both with regard to the um, active times and the quiet times. And also each active time is different in intensity and we now understand that the quiet times as well are not all the same. It's not as if the sun constantly returns to its same state. So this, this uh, plot's about a cycle old. It, uh, um, this last cycle since uh, 2012 or so, uh, I mean, 2010 or so, um, has been a very modest cycle. Uh, it's just come to an end and the next solar cycle uh, is, is now picking up and hopefully we'll get some interesting uh, variability out of that interesting solar ph phenomenon that will drive terrestrial phenomena, hopefully not too interesting. We don't want any catastrophic. So here's the same um, type of, of representation, but in a very different way. Uh, in recent years, we're able to track the solar cycle in X-rays and, and extreme ultraviolet. Uh, here is in X-rays um, from essentially one cycle from maximum down to minimum and back up to maximum. These are one image per year, basically. It's representative of that year. And uh, you can see that as, as we get down to solar minimum, all of this interesting uh, structure dies away. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't still events going on in the sun that are manifesting themselves at Earth, in the upper atmosphere and ionosphere of the Earth, but it's much less dramatic and obviously when something big like this goes off the x-rays. Now, when we see events on the sun, we, people often speak of solar flares. And one thing you may have heard is that, is that uh, aurora, auroral phenomenon, space weather, uh, changes in the ionosphere, that the, this is all driven by solar flares. And that's, that's, uh, that's half true. Um, solar flares do impact the, uh, the uh, outer regions of the Earth's atmosphere and ionosphere, um, but they're really just the, the uh, photon pho manifestation of that phenomenon. They, of course, because they're photons, they get to Earth very rapidly. They do cause ionization and so forth. They uh, um, produce their own uh, electromagnetic radiation over all wavelengths and uh, can be very dramatic, but they don't carry as much energy as the coronal mass ejections to which they are closely related. You could say they're different manifestations of the same solar process. Um, um, I wanted to run this one. This is a, uh, a image, image sequence from a NASA satellite of a solar flare, sorry. There it goes. And you can see all of this hot plasma, meaning mixture of electrons and protons and maybe heavy ions uh, uh, shooting out from the sun. And then, then uh, they're both emitting in the uh, very short wavelength, the energetic X-rays and, 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 and ultraviolet. And also they're scattering solar light, sunlight off of the, um, the electrons that are that are uh, carried near the sun 
here's uh, one of those coronal mass ejections. Um, different in the sense that you actually have uh, um, uh, energetic particles that are uh, still very small light particles, uh, low in density, but much higher than the uh, than the solar flares, and uh, in terms in terms of their total energy. And you can see one here. Look, look at this area here. You'll see it's shooting off to the right. And when one of those impacts the Earth, see it's two of them actually. One up here, one down here, one up here. When one of those impacts the Earth, and of course in this case they're mostly going off to the side. But when you get one coming right at you, um, that is when you have the most dramatic consequences for the uh, the uh, uh, extended atmosphere, ionosphere, and magnetosphere system. So that's illustrated by this uh, NASA sort of cartoon representation of space weather processes. This is what happens when a CME comes right at you. If you could see that, uh, you would see a uh, explosion of light uh, um, directed towards the Earth and entrained in the solar wind. Now we're looking at it from the side. That uh, uh, impacts the magnetic field of the Earth, causing events to occur in the magnetic tail of the magnetosphere, the so-called magneto tail, and energization to occur that uh, uh, interacts ultimately with the Earth's atmosphere and ionosphere. I it all went by very fast, so let me see if I can if I can catch a few highlights here. Uh, this is what the magnetosphere of the Earth roughly looks like if you could see the field lines that define the morphology of the magnetosphere. It, it, it starts as a regular magnetic field, a dipole-shaped magnetic field, but because it's embedded in the solar wind, it gets stretched down in this long magnetotail region. And then at the front end, you form a shock wave because the solar wind, consisting of electrons and protons flowing rapidly out from the sun, more rapidly during one of these big injections, but it's there all the time. And because it's supersonic, and this, again, this is by analogy with, with hydrodynamic processes, just as we can speak of, of, a, of a hydrodynamic flow as something moving within the atmosphere or, or, or uh, for that matter, the ocean. Uh, if, if, um, if it's moving faster than, than uh, the wave propagation speed, we speak of that as, as, uh, as, as uh, uh, supersonic or hypersonic. And the solar wind is the same way, except the, the waves that we're speaking of are, are uh, waves within the magnetized plasma. And so it, it's, uh, and, and since there's a mathematical analogy between, between uh, uh, magnetized plasma motions and, and hydrodynamics, the, uh, 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 atmospheric or, or, or fluid motions, uh, we, we, we pursue that analogy by saying, well, that's a shock wave. And, and then what happens in the magnetotail of the Earth is you get re re reconnection between these magnetic field lines, which are normally distended out into the tail. Um, and this energizes plasma and causes it to flow down the field lines where those field lines connect to the polar regions of the Earth. And consequently, you get emissions of light coming from the, the uh, particles impact in the upper atmosphere that occur in the vicinity of the magnetic poles of the Earth. So that is all a lot to take in from a simple cartoon, uh, but it's a nice illustration. Here's a more of a schematic. Again, it's, it's, it's a simplified sort of imaginary diagram uh, of the structure of the magnetosphere as it connects to the Earth's uh, ionosphere and upper atmosphere. You have the solar wind coming in because it's supersonic. You get a bow shock, just as you would in front of a jet, supersonic jet plane. Um, the, this, this, tends to deflect the solar plasma. Uh, and in, in this sense, the mag magnetic field of the Earth, think of it as almost protecting us from the, uh, 
from uh, changes in dramatic changes in the solar environment. Um, but uh, but at the same time, it, it, this this structure where the these uh, the magnetic field here near the poles connects way down to the to the extended tail of the magnetosphere. Uh, events that occur in the magnetotail map themselves into the uh, uh, into the polar regions of the Earth's ionosphere and causes disruptions of the electric field within this ionosphere that extend over the entire globe. I'll, sh I'll show sort of schematics or, 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 or uh, illustrations of this a couple of times, try to soak it in. Um, it's, not, it's not a simple process, but, but this is the, uh, the big picture of, of where the, of how the, the sun and the solar wind are interacting with the uh, Earth's magnetosphere. So the idea that the, the, so the sun is driving these things, but indirectly, uh, the, the flare effects, although exi they exist, are smaller. And the uh, solar wind effects are, are, can be dramatic, but they're, they're, they're um, modulated or, or uh, translated by the Earth's magnetosphere. Here's a model of that process. Um, the uh, colors are the density of, of electrons flowing in from the solar wind. Um, we have a little compass here indicating which direction the solar magnetic field is. Uh, I mentioned before that the, the magnetic field, which is embedded in the corona, spreads out through the entire solar system, not just near, near the sun. So we're, so we're embedded in both our own magnetic field and the solar magnetic field, which is sometimes referred to as IMF, interplanetary magnetic field. And the interaction between those two things is what causes a lot of the dynamics of, of the magnetosphere that imprint themse imprints itself to the uh, ionosphere atmosphere system. You see that little shock front moving across as, uh, as, a, as a solar coronal mass ejection impacted the uh, Earth's magnetosphere. So, uh, electrons and protons, electrons are doing most of the work here, uh, that are energized in the magnetosphere, can then flow along uh, uh, field, magnetic field lines. This, this little representation here shows that they're, they're actually spiraling along the field lines. Uh, I'll show another representation of that. They're constrained to move uh, uh, by the, by the uh, uh, electromagnetic forces uh, constrain them to constantly move back towards their field line. So if they have a sub motion in a particular direction, they are attempting to go in that direction, but they're constantly connected to the field line because the, the, uh, they feel the electromagnetic force. Um, so that then as they flow into the upper atmosphere and ionosphere of the earth, very high altitude, they collide with things. And uh, this, when they collide with things, they excite them um, and they dissociate them and especially they ionize them. When they, the excitation processes and some of the dissociation processes cause them, the, the atoms and molecules in the Earth's atmosphere to emit light, i.e. the aurora, and the uh, ionization processes contribute to the uh, density of the ionosphere and causes um, additional uh, elect changes to the, the ionospheric electric circuit, which causes a lot of space weather. Um, and you can almost imagine that, you know, if you look at this picture of the aurora, here's, 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 uh, here's currents flowing down into the Earth's ionosphere from the magnetosphere, but it's, they're also flowing along these conduits that are caused by the enhanced ionization. So I'll just say a few words about uh, why I care about these things. Um, uh, uh, we'd like to say, well, not, we are living in a technological society and space weather affects us all. Now, most of the important systems have, have ways to mitigate changes in the, in the ionosphere and changes in the 
magnetic field structure near the Earth's of, of near Earth uh, geospace, as we call it. Um, but you can still cause disruptions in navigation systems such as GPS. Um, sa satellite operations, meaning both both uh, uh, technical things that happen when when particles hit satellites, uh, but also um, uh, navigation in in uh, near Earth space. I'll say a few words about that in just a second. Um, human spaceflight, of course, because humans are vulnerable to radiation of several different types. Communications, especially, um, most of these effects have to do with passing radio waves through the ionosphere or bouncing radio waves off the ionosphere. And, um, and so consequently, uh, large scale and micro scale, all scales really of uh, perturbations in the ionosphere can affect uh, uh, radio communications or other uses to which radio waves are put, such as uh, GPS navigation. Um, aircraft uh, operations, same thing. Uh, uh, navigation is, is, of course, a concern, and any kind of r radio uh, blackouts or um, polar disruptions uh, are of concern to, to, uh, to transportation because aircraft uh, don't like to be out of touch with their uh, with, with ground. Power grid operations is a little different. Um, uh, the perturbations in the in the uh, uh, electromagnetism near the Earth's surface are very small, but when you have a very very long antenna, uh, you can concentrate uh, fluctu small fluctuations and and long power lines can serve as such antennas, and consequently. Uh, uh, power transformers can be um, can be vulnerable to space weather events. Most of those are impacted through design. Uh, when your power goes out, you usually look to a to a windstorm or a hailstorm or something. You don't. The first thing you think of isn't usually that uh, uh, a space weather event has knocked out your power. Um, nevertheless, it's um, it it uh, it has been known to happen. It has to be, it has to be guarded against, and uh, for for uh, for reasons that are still obscure to me, uh, it is a demonstrable fact that uh, the spot the, the spot market for uh, power cost, which is very dynamic, moves moves on, on, on very short time scales, uh, does respond to geomagnetic indices, whether by uh, the law of expectations or, or, or uh, superstition. Uh, it's hard to say why, but it's uh, been demonstrated that uh, people who care about power grids care about space weather. So let me say something about satellite operations. Um, uh, near Earth space is getting very full. Um, uh, even even a little farther from the Earth, this is a um, this is a graphic where every point, every spot on this on this graphic represents a satellite or a piece of something in space. Most of it, most of it is is debris. As I say, most of it is so-called space junk, um, uh, remnants of other satellites things that flew off of satellites when they blew up for one reason or another, or collided with something else causing an explosion. And, um, and as, uh, as we populate space, especially close to the surface, closer to the surface of the earth, uh, with more stuff, we cause more debris and, and, uh, uh, and more risk of collision. And so this, somebody put together this animation for NASA. I think it's sort of spectacular. Um, this outer belt here, this is the geostationary belt. This is where the communication satellites, uh, TV stations are and so forth, uh, because they have the property that they're over a stationary point on earth. Um, and if, if you rotate and come in from the side, you can see that belt. And then there's many objects in sort of middle earth orbit where still it's not terribly highly populated, but as you come in to near Earth space, 
is an incredible density of, of objects um, orbiting the surface of the Earth. Now, of course, it doesn't, it's still, it's not as bad as it looks on this plot because each dot is much bigger than, uh, than a satellite to scale. But, um, but the risk of collision in close here is getting high and growing. Now, at much lower altitude, you have a gap because once things get low, they encounter the atmosphere much more rapidly and, uh, and orbits decay and the satellites burn up. Um, but down to about uh, three or 400 kilometers, you have a belt of, of very high density of functioning satellites. A lot of these are functioning satellites. But most of it is just debris. Uh, the, consequently, the functioning satellites are not, uh, uh, are, are, uh, are not enthralled of the prospects of having to fly through this debris field con constantly. And now uh, there is a prospect of dramatically increasing the population of these near Earth orbiting objects um, uh, due to uh, commercial uh, communications operations. And so, so uh, the changes in those orbits, which occurs when they encounter the neutral atmosphere, even at very high altitude. Now, way out here at geostationary, there's not enough atmosphere to change their orbit. But in close here, as the atmosphere of the Earth changes, the orbits of our functioning satellites change, and, as well as the space debris. And all of it has to be tracked. Um, there's often little you can do about avoiding a collision, but uh, it's, it's nice to know about near misses, uh, which are becoming quite common. So that's one of the rationales for trying to understand not just the ionosphere, but the neutral part of the Earth's upper atmosphere um, into which the ionosphere is embedded. So that's one of the rationale for uh, wanting to understand that. The other rationale being to understand it. another uh, rationale being to understand the ionosphere itself. So I mentioned that the ionosphere is embedded in the thermosphere. Um, there's one uh, factoid takeaway that if you didn't know it before that to take from this overview, this very, very high level overview, it would be that the the ionosphere, you know, it's largely referred to as the ionosphere because it was discovered early on um, through its ability to reflect and refract radio waves, um, is still mostly neutral. It, it, it exists in, in the extended atmosphere of the Earth. You define the atmosphere of the Earth by, by its temperature gradient, troposphere, negative temperature gradient getting colder as you go up in altitude. Stratosphere has a positive temperature gradient, primarily due to heating from ozone, absorption of sunlight by ozone. Um, cools down again as you go up in altitude in this mesosphere region, which has its own peculiar weather. And then if we get into the thermosphere, not only does it dramatically heat, but there's a big difference between solid minimum and solid maximum. Reason for that is that this is a reason that's absorbing all of that extreme ultraviolet radiation from the sun and X rays. And though that region of the sun spectrum is very variable, it also causes ionization. Ionization happens with large cross sections, it's highly probable compared to uh, some of the, uh, the uh, uh, processes that happen lower down. And so even though the density is very low out here in the thermosphere. It's uh, still quite likely that a solar photon of the extreme ultraviolet hits something, and when it does, it ionizes it in general. Um, here is a plot, the same region of density. Note we're going over 12 orders of magnitude on a logarithmic scale. So this tells you two things, the atmosphere is dropping off in density in an exponential fashion. It's a straight line on a log plot. That, that helps explain it to you. Um, and it's dropping off very rapidly. Below 100 kilometers, there's a fundamental difference between what I, there's a, or I should say, a fundamental change that occurs at around 100 kilometers. The atmosphere changes from fully mixed to diffusively separated. What that means is, is that down here where we live, 
is enough turbulence that that uh, that everything gets mixed up and, and the gases don't care how much they weigh. They're going to follow this drop off, this this exponential or logarithmic drop off, uh, all about the same rate. So N two molecular nitrogen and O two atomic uh, molecular oxygen uh, uh, and and other uh, gases that if they're not chemically active, like say ozone, they uh, are all mixed together and they have parallel lines on this logarithmic plot, meaning that their ratios are, are, are fairly constant. You get to 100 kilometers, a couple of things change. One is that all the O2 starts turning into O, that is the molecular oxygen starts turning into atomic oxygen because it's being impacted by those photons, those energetic photons where the sun is getting dissociated and ionized, broken apart. And the other thing that happens is that because the, the molecular diffusion now takes over as a main process and that depends on how much the individual gas weighs or what its mass is. And so what happens is the lighter stuff like atomic oxygen uh, starts starts following its own scale height. That is to say, it, uh, it diffuses upward into space more rapidly and, and drops off more slowly. Whereas the heavier stuff like say molecular nitrogen uh, or especially molecular oxygen drops off much more rapidly. So when you get up into the ionosphere here, um, we'll get to that in a minute. But as, as you get into the upper thermosphere, um, the um, atomic oxygen takes over and eventually the, the uh, upper, upper atmosphere, the th upper part of the thermosphere becomes predominantly atomic oxygen. Whereas down here where we are, uh, it was predominantly molecular nitrogen with fortunately for us, a little bit of molecular oxygen. So, into that atmosphere, we pour all of this electromagnetic radiation, so, so sunlight. Um, down here, the peak of the black body spectrum of the sunlight, it's around 500 nanometers. This is the visible region, and consequently, I've colored it yellow. It's not very variable. What I've done here is I've, I've put a high solar activity spectrum in red behind the, yellow, the uh, low solar activity spectrum in yellow. So the variability appears as this red fringe. And so in the ultraviolet, you can see there's a very small amount of variability. As you get into the extreme ultraviolet, this is the part that causes ionization. Uh, you get a lot of variability, a factor of two between solar minimum and solar maximum. And that becomes as much as an order of magnitude in the X-ray region. So that explains why the, uh, uh, the thermosphere temperatures and densities vary so much with solar activity, they're being controlled by this very short wave, uh, extreme ultraviolet and X-ray radiation that uh, is depositing its energy way up high here, uh, around 100 to 200 kilometers um, and higher. Whereas the, uh, less variable regular ultraviolet is coming down here. Uh, uh, this is not so much ionizing as dissociating parts of the middle atmosphere. And down here, it's being absorbed by ozone, which causes stratospheric heating. And then uh, we get from the ultraviolet to the visible region, it re reaches all the way to the ground. And, uh, but, but by the time we get out here, the solar variability is uh, very small. Uh, less than a tenth of a percent. So um, not only does that cause the temperature of the thermosphere to vary dramatically, but it causes the density of the ionosphere to vary dramatically because the ionosphere is being made by the absorption of all that extreme ultraviolet radiation. And so at solar maximum, we have an ionosphere that as much uh, peaks around up here at around 300 kilometers. It's much more dense, that is they say, there's more ions and electrons than at solar minimum. Uh, the 
Now, as you go from day to night, you also have a big change. And that's because the, uh, the ions up here, primarily O plus, atomic oxygen ion, are fairly long lived, um, more than a day, but they don't last forever. So once the sun goes down at nighttime, they uh, largely uh, diminish their den the density um, as they diffuse back down into the lower ionosphere and as they recombine. In the lower ionosphere, the change is much smaller um, uh, between solar max and solar min, but it's much larger from day to night. And that's because here in the lower ionosphere, you have a lot of molecules, a lot of stuff to react with, a lot of more density, and the, ion, the lifetime of the ions is much smaller. So once the sun goes down, they largely go away and the ionosphere becomes dominated by this so-called F region at high altitude. Um, the F region may look like a conventional Chapman function, but it's really not. It's, it's a balance between the, the, diffusion, the diffusive properties of the ions and the recombination that occurs at lower altitude. And this code, uh, DEF, um, this is, uh, dates back to the dawn of the uh, discovery of the ionosphere. The E region was, found, was discovered first and named the electrical region. And then, and then uh, well, what's above the E region? Turns out that there's a lot of ionosphere above the E region. What are you going to call it? You're going to call it the F region. Um, and so, so, uh, uh, so you will, because this, this, this region is so important to ionosphere electrodynamics, often we just refer to it as the ionosphere and say, oh yes, up in the ionosphere around 300 kilometers. Uh, but even though there's a lot of ions up here, a million per cubic centimeter at its peak and more, uh, they're not nearly as numerous as the neutrals. The ne neutrals still control what's going on to a great degree. The ions have a lot more energy and a lot more motion, but there, there's a lot more neutrals, a thousand times more neutrals, even here at the peak of the ionosphere. And then of course, it only gets more neutral as you go lower, the ions get lower and the new neutrals get higher. So that's why uh, we really refer to thermosphere ionosphere system or the thermosphere ionosphere uh, as a region. Uh, it's still predominantly as a thermosphere, but that's not a term that is as, as familiar to most people as the ionosphere. And here again is this uh, uh, F region, E region, there's a little, little bump here, the E region. It's, uh, that's another one of these historical things. People used to speak of layers um, because uh, when you're bouncing a radio wave off it, it looks like a layer, but it's really a pretty broad layer, especially in the F region. It, it, it's a, it's a more, more of a region than a layer, but you hear people talk about layers a lot. So uh, because the F region has long-lived ions, they can spread out and get entrained in the electrodynamics of the Earth's system. Because the Earth's magnetic field has a strong interaction with the, the electrodynamical terms, uh, um, you get two big belts of, of ion, ionization in, in the F region, one on each side of the magnetic equator. And, uh, and though those regions are subject to instabilities and uh, dynamical plasma product, pro, um, processes that res respond a lot to the Earth's lower atmosphere and form another type of, ion of ionospheric variability. But for the, uh, the type of uh, space weather that's uh, solar driven that we're mostly speaking about today, um, uh, it starts in the polar regions. Uh, here is another uh, ultraviolet uh, image of the aurora. Again, again, if you uh, were, were, were to see this in the, in the visible, it would be super bright over here in the illuminated part. This is, this is the part of the atmosphere that's illuminated by the sun. And you get, uh, you get certain emission processes in the ultraviolet, but the aurora can compete with those. And so this is a good 
visualization of uh, of where the aurora is, but it's it's very smeared out. This is a, this is a sort of a discovery image from uh, 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 several decades ago. We first, we're able to make a comprehensive image of the uh, of the aurora from from fairly high altitude, and so it's kind of, it, it, it took twelve minutes to make this image, and it's kind of smeared out both spatially and temporally. Um, from the from the space shuttle, we were able to get chromatic images from low Earth orbit. Um, you can sort of you can see all this structure that's actually occurring in the aurora. This interesting color morphology with the red parts of the middle visible spectrum at high altitude and this blue green part at a uh, lower altitude. Um, the this the, the uh, hard limb of the Earth, the uh, solid Earth, starts all the way down here. And this is where the aurora is depositing. Most of it's down to up around 100 kilometers. Here's a dramatic one from the, uh, from the uh, space station. This is time-lapse photography. Um, it's sped up by, oh, about a factor of 10, I think. Um, the aurora is not moving around that fast and nor is the, is, is the uh, space station, but it nicely captures uh, just how dynamic uh, the, uh, the, these currents are that are connecting the magnetosphere and the ionosphere and are uh, controlling and training the aurora uh, being the, uh, the optical manifestation, in this case, actual visible light radiation that's uh, being generated by the impact of all those energetic particles that are following along with the current system. So uh, here's uh, uh, just just to emphasize this this uh, this high altitude red uh, medium altitude uh, green greenish blue. Uh, this is a photo. This is a photo I took in Alaska. Um, uh, uh, showing a, a mod moderate aurora uh, activity. You can almost see the uh, the uh, curvature of the the uh, aurora lowlands that stretches across the horizon away from it. I'll show a few other images. This is uh, one of the last ones that I actually took myself. Oh, let's see. Let's uh, back, back a bit. Let's let's just re recapitulate what's going on here. Um, we're getting uh, uh, optical emissions. They're being generated by electron impact processes that occur when reconnection occurs in the magnetic tail of the Earth and causes charged particles, in this case, primarily electrons, to flow back down towards the Earth. These field lines connect in the polar regions. Consequently, we get the polar aurora, sometimes or polaris. Um, he, they're, they're moving along field lines because they're constrained to travel along spiral trajectories. Um, and uh, and consequently, the field line morphology controls the the uh, electrical field morphology and the aurora morphology. Here's another one of these nice NASA uh, cartoon animations that sort of help you visualize that. Imagine that these were flux tubes skewing charged particles from the magnetosphere down into the atmosphere. Uh, here 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 they go. These are the electrons moving along their spiral trajectories, and dumping out into uh, the vacuum of near Earth space until they encounter the atmosphere. Once they encounter the atmosphere, they start hitting things. Um, if they uh, hit one of these gray atomic oxygen atoms, they might grow, glow red if they're at high altitude. If they're at lower altitude, they are more likely to glow green, although it's coming from the same atomic oxygen, or they might hit a molecular nitrogen, one of these two-part blue things and emit light in the blue and at other wavelengths. The aurora, auroral spectrum is much more complex than that, but that's a nice way to think about it and explains the basic morphology of the multiple colors that make up the aurora. Um, the, uh, the, there's, there's atomic physics regions why the red tends to occur at high altitude, green at lower altitude. 
has to do with the long lifetime of the red emissions, the so-called O in the uh, singlet D, metastable excited state. Uh, because it has a long lifetime, it's unlikely to, to emit at low altitude because it will encounter some molecule or atom and become collisionally deactivated before it has a chance to emit. Um, how far down into the atmosphere do the electrons penetrate? Well, it depends on how energetic they are. The more energetic they are, the uh, deeper they go. And that therefore controls some of the phenomenology of the auroral emissions. Um, they can get even below 100 kilometers into that mixed region of the Earth's uh, upper atmosphere. But most of the auroral forms are, are uh, coming down in here, 100, 120 kilometers, except for the very soft uh, electrons, which, which uh, preferentially uh, deposit at somewhat higher altitude. And, and again, these soft ones can emit up, even up above 200 kilometers. When they, when they encounter the neutral atmosphere, again, here's one of these plots with the neutral atmosphere and the ionosphere on the same axes, dash lines for the neutrals, solid lines for the ions, black solid line for the electron density. When the aurora comes in, you get an enhancement of electron density in the 100 to 200 kilometer region. And, uh, and that is accompanied by uh, the optical emissions, but also uh, enables the currents to flow, the magnetic currents to flow through the ionosphere because you have more conductivity here in the ionosphere because you have more electrons and ions. So just an overview, the, the uh, aurora is usually pretty, pretty green in appearance uh, because that, that green atomic oxygen emission is pretty dominant. Um, it takes a, uh, a fair amount of energy to be able to separate out this sort of green blue from, from the red at high altitude, but you can see that from the ground uh, easier with photography. Um, here's uh, some nice uh, images from Alaska by, taken by my colleague Dave Fritz uh, during a really major storm. Uh, this you even get the red at lower altitude. This is a different different emission, but uh, it's another nitrogen emission that happens when aurora gets down to very low altitude uh, as the as the uh, geomagnetic storm breaks up. You have uh, all this structure uh, occurs in, in the uh, emission forms and, pro and presumably in the electric fields as well. This is uh, looking straight up one of these one of these features, the so-called aurora corona. You can see the convergence of the uh, forms to, to uh, the zenith as, as you look up. This, that's to say the mag magnetic zenith. As you look up the field line toward the pole, um, there's a lot of vorticity in those in those features. Here's, here's a, this is another one I took from Greenland. A fairly long time exposure, trying to capture. Uh, just how much this feature is swirling around as you look up the, this, uh, this uh, 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 along this field line, and you could even call it a flex tube, um, may, may contain some clue as to the nature of the reconnection mechanisms. Uh, this is a nice evocative picture because it, because it, this is uh, from another one from the NASA archives uh, coming out of the, the uh, space shuttle era um, captures nicely the idea that, that the energy source for the aurora is in fact the sun, uh, but this is not the sun, of course, it's the moon. If it were the sun, everything would be too bright for us to see anything. Um, and here finally is one of my own, you may recognize the locale if you're local. This is the, uh, this is the boulder flat irons in the background. Uh, deciduous trees, it's, it's even November in this photo. And th this is very overexposed, but you can see the NCAR Mesa lab um, in the foreground, uh, partly illuminated and uh, 
at, at the Mesa Lab, if you ever get to go back into it again, is, is this you, you you may find this photo in a few different places. Um, so, just to talk a little bit about our efforts at NCAR uh, to capture all this, here here's uh, here's an animation from a uh, slightly older model, a little lower resolution, but capturing the effect of of a storm as it impacts the um, hemisphere ionosphere system, both the lower ionosphere where you have uh, uh, the aurora very visible in, in basically ion density here, that changes the neutral temperature all throughout the, uh, the thermosphere. And that changes the composition of the thermosphere. This is, remember I said it was mostly atomic oxygen and molecular nitrogen. If you look at the ratio of those things, that's quite variable, uh, especially in response to these storms. And that the combination of temperature and composition cause the electron density in the F region to also be quite variable as uh, the storm progresses. And uh, this, this, this is too much information at once, but, but uh, if you uh, wanted to see that simultaneously instead of sequentially, it would look like this with the aurora driving everything and the neutral atmosphere impacting the, uh, the electron density in the ionosphere just as the auroral electrodynamics also impact the, uh, the ionosphere. So in order to understand that, we need higher resolution models, we need better time resolution, we need more complexity and a more uh, 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 realistic magnetosphere physics. Um, and that's all uh, attempted by a new partnership uh, led by uh, colleagues, uh, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. It's a, it's a study for a proposed NASA Center, called the DRIVE Center, typical acronym. And one of our main goals is to uh, construct improved coupled models of this magnetosphere, ionosphere atmosphere system. I'll just show some previews from what we're trying to accomplish. This is also a uh, animation of the ionospheric response to a geomagnetic storm, um, but at considerably more resolution. And looking especially at that equatorial feature, um, it's, it's there all the time. But when the storm hits, which is about now, it becomes completely dynamic, changes its morphology entirely. You can see all the action going on at high latitudes. And uh, you can see that uh, although the magnetic field at the, near the equator is still in charge, and, and we're uh, going back to its to the baseline configuration with one arc on each side of the magnetic equator, which is going down through here. Uh, the storm has had a lot to say about reconfiguring the entire ionospheric system. Um, let's show this one quickly, wrap this up. The, uh, the neutral atmosphere is also very dynamic and response to one of these storms. This is a polar view of the North and South Poles of, uh, of waves in the neutral density coming out of the auroral region in response to day-to-day -day variability, which you're seeing now, and a storm, which is about to start. And these plots and the dots moving through the colors are, are, are data of density from a couple of satellites just to show that we can capture most of the variability we see in the density, but we don't capture it perfectly, not yet, maybe not ever, but, but uh, we can capture some of these peaks, you know, these spikes in density as the satellites move through these fe fe these wave-like features we call traveling atmospheric disturbances. Here come some big ones. See us, didn't do too well on that one, but this one here, we can capture uh, density change very nicely. So this is pretty high resolution stuff. This is uh, uh, using resolution comparable to the big planet models. So I'm gonna wrap this up here. Uh, I'm just gonna anticipate a question just in case, uh, I've written it down just in case you, uh, this is something you wanted, not, not an uncommon question. Um, where can you see the aurora? Well, you may have a better chance if we get more solar activity. Um, 
you, what you really need is is uh, it's see space weather is is uh, is good is good weather. Um, a fairly dark sky doesn't have to be perfectly dark. The aurora is always there, usually very high magnetic latitude. Um, if you don't, if you're not near a magnetic pole, you want some activity so that this expansion of the aurora lobe brings it down to lower, lower uh, latitude, lower magnetic latitude, and uh, help you bring it bring it within your sight range. Um, uh, equinoxes are a little better than the solstice. But that's not a very, uh, that's just a statistical variation. Um, uh, forecasting is in its infancy, but there is a, a commercial and government websites that you can, that you can go to to uh, try to anticipate when there might be some moral activity. Um, and uh, consequently, you can position yourself in a place to see it. There's even apps. And uh, here are some examples of uh, graphics from the NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center and, um, and, and, other, and other locations of in international nature. So there's information out there uh, with a little interpretation about this, all this having to do with solar and wind measurements. You can, uh, you can try to figure out when might be a good time to see the aurora, um, or you can uh, exploit geographic serendipity if you ever are in, uh, for instance, Alaska, uh, which is really well situated geomagnetically for uh, this type of observation. Um, so I will uh, wrap this up here um, and be glad to field any questions. Great, well, thank you so much, Stan. That was wonderful. It was very insightful on kind of learning about what is one type of space storms caused by um, specifically solar driven space storms today. And one of the biggest things I learned was that solar flares and um, coronal mass ejections are different. And there's a lot more um, photons that are passing through space, uh, like from the coronal mass ejection. So it's going to be really interesting to see how um, the sun keeps evolving <laughs> um, in time. And um, yeah, so we do have a few questions on Slido. So I can ask Dan, would you be able to post up the questions? And then Stan, you can just go through the questions um, as they were asked. And, um, and I'll just uh, let you handle those. How vulnerable are our, is our electrical grid to these coronal mass ejections? When was the last time the earth took a direct hit? Um, we got we got uh, uh, some pretty good pretty good hits in uh, 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 2013, 2014, and then most recently 2017. Uh, as I mentioned, this last solar cycle, totally different subject, but this last solar cycle was not particularly strong. We didn't get a, a lot of big storms. We didn't get a lot of of uh, of, of radiation of of variability in the solar output in the uh, extreme ultraviolet. Um, but this upcoming, this one that's just starting now may be, um, may be stronger. Um, uh, uh, there used to be a fair amount of skepticism about impacts on electrical power grids. Um, uh, I remember one of the NASA administrators a while ago said, well, somebody please show me a picture of an electrical Transformer that's been knocked out by a space weather storm, and and but then people produced them. Um, uh, it's it's not a common or frequent event, uh, um, but and, and as I said, I believe without any with a total lack of expertise in this area, but I believe that they are finding ways to engineer around this type of, of problem, which is. Of course, the answer to a lot of space weather uh, problems is, is uh, to a great degree, uh, uh, you, you want to build systems that are robust enough to withstand uh, space weather events, which of course leads you to the question, well, how bad can it get? 
so so um, uh, uh, I would say that uh, serious power outages, uh, transformer uh, damage uh, is is not a common thing, at least not now, but it is certainly possible. And uh, and one of the things that's been pointed out um, is that for these very large transformers, which maybe have some vulnerability, um, uh, replacement can be a very uh, large scale and time consuming task. And so, and you know, you, you, know, you can't just go, you, you can't you can't buy a you can't buy one of these giant transformers on Amazon and just have it delivered the next day. You know, it it, it can be consequential if, if one of these if one of these things goes. So um, uh, and and also there's a lot of concern about analogous processes such as uh, electromagnetic pulses that can be human induced. Uh, that's not an area where I have any expertise e either, but I know that there's a lot of interest in certain segments in, in that subject. Thank you so much. And it takes a lot of engineering to make sure to work with you um, to be able to keep our infrastructure. But yeah, to, to, some degree, to some degree, the space science side of this it, it can be uh, considered to be uh, uh, putting, putting upper limits on things. Uh, uh, you know, we think of this an analogy with you know, by using the word space weather, we think, well, that must be analogous to tropospheric weather. And well, what do you want to do with tropospheric weather? Well, of course you want to forecast it, um, but a forecast will only get you so far. Um, okay, so why do aurora form at different altitudes despite different colors? I started to touch on that, but it's really a whole much longer story. Um, uh, it's it's due to two primary things. One is, the change in composition, that is the, the molecules and atoms that make up the upper atmosphere, changing over from atomic oxygen at high altitude to, to uh, mostly molecular oxygen, molecular nitrogen, and also molecular oxygen at uh, lower altitude. If you, if you can bear to think of 100 kilometers as being low altitude, and who doesn't, uh, then, then uh, you get a different mixture of colors as, as things change with altitude. Also the storm, it's, storms themselves change the composition mix. And then on top of that, you get basic atomic physics. Things that are long lived, meaning long, have long lifetimes against radiation, preferentially emit at high altitude because when they get down to lower altitude, before they have a chance to emit, they get what we call delision, collisionally deactivated. They undergo collisional deactivation. They run into something else. Um, and, uh, and, and that collision takes away the extra energy of excitation before it can have a chance to emit. So, so you get a complex interplay of all these different things. And, and, and that explains the, uh, that explains the fact that there is so much variability in the auroral spectrum, uh, but it still mean, means that it's a daunting task to uh, take, take a driving mechanism and, uh, and reconstruct what the auroral spectrum might be or vice versa to look at an auroral spectrum and figure out what's going on. Awesome, thank you so much. Dan, can we see what the next question is? Uh, what's the scientific rationale for high geomagnetic activity near the equinoxes? Oh, that's uh, um, that's an even longer story and and uh, and and maybe a little bit controversial. Um, uh, it's 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 called the Russell McFerrin effect because uh, Chris Russell and Bob McFerrin first identified it. Um, if you look statistically uh, at at, uh, at uh, indices of geomagnetic activity. You, you will see a slight preference for the equinoxes. And that has to do with the way that the, earth, or the theory is that that, ha, that that has to do with the way that the Earth's magnetic field lines up with the solar magnetic field, the so-called interplanetary magnetic field. And 
And when, it, when during the equinoxes, you have a more favorable um, configuration for, for magnetic reconnection, uh, it doesn't affect the likelihood that there'll be a big solar storm, right? If there's a big solar storm, a big coronal mass ejection, uh, that, that's not gonna care where the earth is in its orbit, whether it's equinox or solstice. But there's a lot of lower level activity that's going on all the time that, that uh, can be slightly amplified by this alignment between the solar magnetic field and the earth's magnetic field. And of course, that alignment also can affect the way that a major solar storm, uh, coronal mass ejection, can uh, interact with the Earth, uh, but probably uh, has a, has less of an effect on its absolute magnitude. Great, thank you so much. That was that is like a whole research in itself. Dan, can you please um, share with us what is the next question that we may have? Do other particles, protons, atomic, and nuclei from a CME also contribute to the aurora? And if yes, in what way? Um, the, uh, uh, this, the, um, they, they, they contribute to, um, to impacts on the Earth's atmosphere. They don't tend to make as much in the way of Visible manifestation or ultraviolet, you know, of, of light emitted from the aurora, uh, they tend to be much more spread out than these highly structured forms that come basically from the magnetosphere of the Earth. But there, uh, you know, there's so many aspects of solar activity. I don't have time to touch on all of them. One phenomenon is known as solar proton events, and th these are these are in fact particles from the side. Try to drive a couple of messages. Uh, Ionosphere is, is, is mostly neutral. Uh, aurora doesn't, isn't just particles from the sun, it's really more like particles from the magnetosphere. But solar proton events really are particles from the sun that are energetic enough to penetrate the magnetosphere. They tend to uh, deposit their energy at even lower altitudes uh, where they contribute to the chemistry of the middle atmosphere and uh, in a minor way, but but uh, but they can impact um, the uh, uh, the chemical processes through the same sort of mechanisms of uh, dissociating and even ionizing things. But um, but they but in uh, terms when we say aurora, we think of the visible manifestations and the stuff that you can see uh, either from space or from the ground. They don't tend to, to contribute. Uh, as much to that aspect of the phenomenon. They're harder, harder to see a solar proton event unless you have specialized instruments in space. Wow, there's just so much going on up there. It's, it's crazy because I just kind of worry about what's, what's happening in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I guess the, 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 so people, people get caught up in this stuff too, uh, too much sometimes. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's not like the aurora is coming into your t television set and, and electrocuting everybody in your house. It's, uh, 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 it has more to do with uh, currents flowing either at high altitude or through very long conductors. Awesome, thank you. And then we do have a final question, Dan, if you can post it up and it asks more, more so what's your day like at work? And I kind of wonder if this can be kind of like, what kind of work are you doing? Are you doing the computational is, aspect is this, of the research? Is this, uh, is this is this is this a uh, is this a question for the last eight months or so, <laughs> or uh, <laughs> or, uh, or or a more generic uh, uh, career-based question? I think um, it might be the career-based question. <laughs> I think so, uh, um, and uh, and of course, since most of my work is done on computers, uh, you know, we have the great good fortune. Of being able to continue working during the uh, during the stay-at-home environment, although uh, like everybody, it uh, requires a lot of reorientation in a lot of different ways. But that aside, um, uh, my my daily work is uh, is on largely on 
uh, contributing to my areas of expertise as they pertain to this, this large scale model development to which I alluded and and uh, and in utilizing measurements uh, primarily from space-based vehicles from that primarily from NASA but also from uh, ground-based sources and from sort of hybrid sources like GPS I, I mentioned disruptions of GPS we can use GPS measurements now known as GNSS measurements to infer ionospheric process pro properties and um, and and uh, uh, both, both space-based and ground-based uh, uh, aspects of that type of measure, and um, and using those measurements to try to tell us if our models are doing the right thing, if they're any good, if they or try to figure out what areas they need improvement. So model data comparison is, is a large part of it, um, and uh, and then uh, um, and then communicating the results of that research, uh, both in a specialized and uh, general audience, um, preparation of talks for meetings and uh, uh, writing uh, results for publications. And then uh, of course, particularly as years go by, one becomes in, in trade more in management processes and in uh, trying to organize teams of scientists uh, you know these 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 giant models. I I haven't said much too much about our new approaches to this high resolution ionosphere thermosphere modeling, but it's a lot of it is is um, built upon uh, uh, numerical processes that are used in the big in-car climate and weather models. We can use a lot of that of those mechanism mechanisms at much higher altitude, uh, basically moving out of the regime for which they were intended. And so consequently, you're, you're participating in an enormous model development process, which takes very big teams of scientists, each working on different aspects of the process. And that takes a lot of organization, a lot of meetings, a lot of management. And uh, so the reality is, is that, uh, especially at a, at a national center like NCAR, uh, um, uh, the reality is, is far from the uh, canonical idea of the sci scientist working alone in his office, uh, uh, you know, pouring over uh, equations, trying to, uh, trying to uh, make a contribution in a uh, isolated fashion. It's a much more collaborative process. Now. That's awesome. And I know that you mentioned the Center for Geospace Storms with a lot more work that's going to be coming out in the next couple of years. So we definitely look forward to being able to follow your path and your like all of your collaborators, the work that comes out from that. Many, many universities, many universities and other organizations are involved in that, um, and which is its own challenge for uh, long distance work. Yeah, especially right now with travel restrictions, but um, it's great that we have the technologies to be able to talk with each other, even from our own homes. And with that, um, I don't see that we have any other questions. So I would like to just say thank you so much, Dr. Stan Solomon, for sharing an inside view of what are these space storms and some awesome photos of the field photos that you've taken yourself. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. And for everybody watching, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I love having these lectures. I know we've been having a lot of conversations with scientists. And so we're gonna to continue to do um, a little bit of a lot. If you are, if you had registered, we'll send out the survey to get some feedback from you all, how we're doing for this NCAR Explorer series and things that you might wanna see in the coming new year. Well, thank you, Stan. And um, thank you everybody. And with that, we'll say goodbye and we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you.